The Amatieza, according to the narrative of Lewis and Clark, is the name given by the Minotaurs, not to the Yellowstone, but to the Missouri itself. We made our camp to the south shore in a beautiful plain covered with cottonwood. May 14th. This morning we were all awake and stirring in an early hour as the point we had reached now was one of a great importance, and it was requisite that before proceeding any farther, we should make some survey by way of ascertaining which of the two large streams in view would afford us the best passage onward. It seems to be the general wish of the party to push up one of these rivers as far as practicable, with the view of reaching the Rocky Mountains when we might perhaps hit the, upon the head waters of the large stream. A Reagan, described by all the Indians with whom we have conversed upon the subject, as running in the Great Pacific Ocean. I was also nervous to attain this object, which opened to my fancy a world of exciting adventure, but I foresaw many difficulties which we must necessarily encounter if we made the attempt with our present limit limited information in respect to the region we should have to traverse and the savages who occupied it, about which later we only knew indeed that they were generally the most ferocious of the North American Indians. I was afraid too that we might get into this wrong stream and involve ourselves in an endless labyrinth of troubles which would dishearten the men. These thoughts However, did not give me any long uneasiness, and I set to work at once to explore the neighborhood, sending some of the party up the banks to each stream to estimate the comparative volume of water in each, while I myself, with Thornton and John Greeley, proceeded to ascend the high grounds in the fork, once an extensive prospect of the surrounding region might have be attained. We saw here an immense and magnificent country spreading out on every side into a vast plain, living with glorious verdure, and was alive with countless herds of buffaloes and wolves, intermingled with occasional elk and antelope. To the south, the, the prospect was interrupted by a, a range of high, snow-capped mountains, stretching from southeast to the northwest and terminating abruptly. Behind these again was a higher range extending to the very horizon in the northwest. The two rivers presented the most enchanting appearance as they wound away their long snake-like flanks into the distance, growing thinner and thinner until they looked like mere faints of threads of silver as they vanished into the shadowy mists of the sky. We could glean nothing from their direction as far, so far as regards their ultimate course and so descended from their opposition that much at a loss what to do. The examination of the two currents gave us but little more satisfaction. The north stream was found to be the deeper, but the south was the wider, and the volume of the water differed but little. The first had the color of the Missouri, but the latter had the peculiar round gravelly bed which distinguishes a river that issues from the mountainous region. We were finally determined by the easier navigation of the north branch to pursue this course, although the, from the rapidly increasing shallowness we found that in a few days at farthest we should have to dispense with a larger boat. We spent three days at our encampment, during which we collected a make great many fine skins and deposited them with our whole stack stock on island on hand in a well-constructed cachet on a small island in the river a mile below the junction. Editor's footnote. Caches are holes very frequently dug by the trappers and fur traders in which to deposit their furs or other goods during a temporary absence. A dry and retired situation is first selected. A circle about two feet in diameter is then described. The side within this is carefully removed and laid by. A hole is now dunk, uh, sunk perpendicularly to the depth of a foot and afterwards gradually widened until the excavation become, becomes eight or ten feet deep and the six or ten, seven feet wide. As the earth is dug up, it is 
cautiously placed on a skin so as to prevent any traces upon the grass, and when all is completed, is thrown into the nearest river, or otherwise effectually concealed. This cachet is lined throughout with, with dried sticks and hay, or with skins, and within almost any species of black of backwoods property, maybe safely and soundly kept for years. When the goods are in and well kept covered with buffalo hide, earth is thrown upon the hole and stamped firmly down. Afterwards, the sod is replaced and a private mark made upon the neighboring the trees. Or elsewhere, indicating the precise location of the vehicle. We also brought in a great quantity of game, and especially of deer, some haunches of which we pickled or quartered for future use. We found great abundance of prickly pear in this vicinity, as well as chokeberries in great plenty upon the low grounds in the ravines. There were also many yellow and red currants not ripe with gooseberries. Wild roses were just beginning to open up their buds in the most beautiful, wonderful provision. We left our encampment in fine spirits on the morning of April, oh, May 18th. The day was pleasant and we proceeded merrily notwithstanding. The constant interruptions occasioned by the shoals and jutting points with which the streams abound. The men, one and all, were enthusiastic in their determination to persevere, and the Rocky Mountains were the sole theme of conversation. In leaving our pouches behind us, we considerably lightened the boats, and we found much less difficulty in getting them forward with, through the rapid currents than would otherwise have been the case. The river was crowded with islands, and nearly all of which we touched. At night, we reached an abandoned Indian encampment through near bluffs of a blackish clay. Rattlesnakes disturbed us very much, but and before morning, we had a heavy rain. May 19th. We had not proceeded far beyond before we found the character of the stream materially altered and very much obstructed by sandbars or rather ridges of small stones, so that it was with the greatest difficulty we could force a passage for the larger boat. Sending two men ahead to Reconteur, we returned with an account of wider and deeper channel above, and once again we found encouraged to persevere. We pushed on for ten miles and encamped on a small island for the night. We observed a particular mountain in the distance to the south of a conical form. Isolated and Entirely covered with snow. May 20th. We now entered into a better channel and pursued our course with a little interruption for 16 miles through a clay country of particular character. Peculiar character. And nearly destitute of vegetation. At night we encamped on a very large island and covered with some tall trees many of which were new to us. We remained at this spot for five days to make some repairs in the parogue. During our sojourn here, an incident of note occurred. The banks of the Missouri in this neighborhood are precipitous and formed of a peculiar blue clay, which becomes excessively slippery after rain. The cliffs from the bed of the stream back to the distance of a hundred yards or thereabouts form a succession of steep terraces of this clay intersected in numerous directions by deep and narrow ravines, so sharply worn by the action of water at some remote period of time as to have the appearance of artificial channels. The mouths of these ravines, where they debouch upon the river, have a very remarkable appearance, and look from the opposite bank by moonlight like gigantic columns standing erect upon the shore. To an observer, from the uppermost terrace, the most the whole descent toward the stream has an indescribably chaotic and dreary air. No vegetation of any kind is seen. John Greeley, the prophet, the interpreted 
Interpreter Jules and myself and started out after breakfast one morning to ascend the topmost terrace of the south shore for the purpose of looking around us and, in short, to see what could be seen. With great labor and by using scrupulous caution, we succeeded in reaching the level grounds of the summit opposite our encampment. The prairie here differed from the general character of that which kind of land and being thickly overground for many miles back with cottonwood, rose bushes, red willow, and broadleaf willow. The soil being unsteady and at times swampy, like that of the ordinary low grounds, it consists of a black looking loam, one third sand, and when it, a handful of it is thrown into water, it dissolves in a matter of sugar with strong bubbles. In several spots we observed deep encrustations of common salt, some of which we collected and used. Upon reaching these level grounds, we all sat down to rest, and had scarcely done so when we are alarmed by the loud growl immediately in our rear, proceeding from the thick underwood. We started to our feet and at once great terror, for we had left our rifles at the island and that we might be uncumbered and scramble up the cliffs, and the only arms we had were the pistols and knives. We had scarcely time to say a word to each other before two enormous brown bears, the first we had yet encountered during our, the voyage, came rushing at us open mouth from a clump of rose bushes. These animals are much dreaded by the Indians and with reason, for they are indeed formidable creatures, possessing prodigious strength and with an untamable ferocity and the most wonderful tenacity of life. There is scarcely any way of killing them but by a bullet, unless the shot be through the brains and these are defended by two large muscles covering the sides of the forehead, as well as by a projection of a thick frontal 